Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here with us this evening. Uh, I know that uh, many of you are going to uh, log on in a few minutes. Uh, and as Lisa mentioned, we are joined by uh, many alumni from all over the Americas, all of the Americas. We're delighted to welcome you to our first Texas Global Dialogues, co-hosted with the Texas Exes. Our program this evening uh, on journalism in Latin America promises to be extremely engaging. And um, it is unfortunate that we only have an hour and 15 minutes to learn from our distinguished guests. Um, we have over 135 participants that um, uh, showed an interest in being here with us today from 11 countries uh, and about 80% of whom are alumni. So you've taken a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat room, please continue to do so. I will share a little bit about Texas Global uh, and our mission. We're very much committed to advancing uh, UT's academic mission by leading, supporting, and coordinating the university's international engagement efforts. We develop strategic partnerships on campus and abroad. We welcome an impressive cadre of international students and scholars to campus, and we create opportunities for students and faculty to engage with peers and institutions around the world. Um, some brief background, I came on board at UT Austin about a year and a half ago. And one of the many activities I, I identified early on pertained to our engagement with our alumni around the world. During my first year, I had the privilege of um, traveling um, and meeting many of you in person in Mexico and Panama, South Korea, Japan, and many other countries. And I walked away from our meetings with the same takeaway message, which was to make every effort for UT Austin to connect its academic mission with our global Longhorn community. So informed by these conversations, we launched the Texas Global Dialogues, which is an initiative to showcase UT's intellectual enterprise with a focus on uh, engaging our alumni abroad. And we did so um, in collaboration with the Texas Exes, which is a very exciting uh, first time opportunity where we're working together to really uh, uh, bring our expertise and bring UT's mission uh, to our alumni all over the world. So this new series of events, currently virtual, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, COVID um, is designed for our UT alumni across the globe to meet and participate in meaningful conversations with each other and with the university. Each event will be focused on the region of the world and convene a panel of UT faculty and alumni leaders for in-depth discussions on topics of global interest. We're thrilled to launch this initiative, um, as I said, in partnership with the Texas Exes. The Texas Exes currently has numerous chapters and networks in many countries and growing. So we encourage you to learn more about the Texas Exes chapters and programs near you. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the executive director and president of the Texas Exes uh, and welcome Chuck Harris with us today, who will give a few words. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sonia, so much. Um, so we like to say uh, at the Texas Exes, we have 530,000 alumni around the world. Um, and it's great to finally meet some of you, um, although we're doing it virtually. Um, you know, we're a 135 year old organization and I, I, I think about what the early days must have been like in the small gatherings and to think today that we're connected via our computers or our phones or our tablets around the world and to be able to do something like this globally is uh, fantastic and a very exciting opportunity. So um, we of course welcome our, our, our audience and panelists tonight for this conversation about journalism in Latin America. The opportunity to uh, collaborate and partner um, with Texas Globals is fantastic. I think we're creating some here that's going to be, uh, we're going to grow uh, into other regions and around the world. So as you're a bit of our test bed, but I think um, uh, we will do many more of these hopefully. Uh, and I know for sure the, the Texas X's and working with Texas Global will be much more deliberate uh, as we try to take this programming around the world. So today's conversation, I'm sure going to be give us plenty of food for thought. Uh, I'm also eager to hear from our panelists. Um, while we had hoped these events would take place in country, uh, thankfully we have these virtual platforms that 
allow us to connect each other and share um, across uh, time zones and borders and so forth. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, and again, I hope this will be the first of many. And thank you, Sonia, for the partnership. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. And now I'd like to introduce our distinguished um, panelists. Uh, and I'll start with um, our uh, very own um, Rosenthal Alves. Um, Rosenthal is the Knight Chair in Journalism and UNESCO Chair in Communication. He's also the founder and director of the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas at UT Austin's Moody College of Communication in the School of Journalism. Rosenthal began his career, academic career in the US um, in March 1996 after 27 years working as a professional journalist, including seven years as a journalism professor in Brazil. He was selected in 1995 to be the first holder of the Knight Chair in International Journalism created by a $1.5 million endowment from the James L. and John S. Knight Foundation. Later, he was also awarded with the UNESCO Chair in Communication and became the president of Orbicon, the global network of UNESCO Chairs in Communication from 2008 to 2012. In 2016, Rosenthal received the prestigious Maria Moore's Cabot Prize from the Columbia uh, School of Journalism for excellence in journalism and his contributions to inter-American understanding. He is a working journalist since he was 16. Rosenthal received his BA in journalism from the Rio de Janeiro Federal University. He was also the first Brazilian awarded a Neiman Fellowship to spend an academic year at Harvard University. And so I'd like to thank you, Rosenthal, for being here with us this evening. We really want to showcase the Knight Center and all of the great work that uh, you've, done, you've done at UT Austin. We're also joined by Patricia Campos Melo. Uh, Patricia is a reporter at large and columnist at the Folha de Sao Paulo newspaper in Brazil. In the past three years, Patricia has spent time in Syria, Iraq, Libya, Turkey, Lebanon, and Kenya reporting on refugees and migration. She was the only Brazilian reporter to cover the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone in 2014 and 2015. In July, she just published her book, A Maquina do Odio, Notas de un Reporter sobre Fake News e Violencia Digital. So it's a rough translation, um, The Machine of Hate, notes from a reporter about fake news and digital violence, about disinformation campaigns, the erosion of freedom on the press in Brazil, of the press in Brazil, and the intimidation of journalists led by the Bolsonaro administration. In 2020, Patricia, Patricia received the prestigious Maria Moore's Cabot Prize. She has a degree in journalism from the University of Sao Paulo and a master's uh, in business and economic reporting from New York University. She also attended uh, UT Austin as a transfer student in the Moody College of Communication School of Journalism. And we're delighted to have you with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, Javier Garza uh, is also with us today. He's a journalist based in Torreón, Northern Mexico, where he founded Enredos Laguna, a local news video platform. And he also hosts a daily radio news program. He's a contributor for El País, the most prominent uh, newspaper in Spain. Javier has specialized in freedom of the press and issues of journalist protection. While he was the editorial director of El Siglo de Torreón, the newspaper became a target of organized crime groups for its coverage, coverage of drug trafficking. He has trained hundreds of journalists in Mexico and Latin America on physical and digital, digital safety and serves as advisor in newsroom safety for the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers. Javier was a Knight Fellow at the International Center for Journalists, and he serves on the boards of the World Editors Forum, Article 19, and the, Interest, and the Internet Freedom Festival. He received his bachelor's degree from the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City and a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin School of Journalism in the Moody School College of Communication. It's great to have you here, Javier. And Fernando Paulson, um, here with us as well, is a prominent news radio host in Chile. 
He regularly hosts two news shows on CNN Chile, but due to COVID-19, the shows have been postponed and Paulson hosts a daily three-hour radio broadcast conducting interviews for CNN on issues related to the pandemic. Fernando's professional career has included serving as the managing director of Chile's largest newspaper, La Tercera, and working for La Red TV and national television. For the last 12 years, he has taught communication and change in the economics department at the University of Chile. He moved to the U.S. in 1979 to earn his B.A. from the University of North Texas, and he began his M.A. in journalism at UT Austin. However, due to political unrest, he was unable to finish his degree. Fernando completed a Master of Arts in Public Administration from Harvard University. Thank you so much for being part of the panel, Fernando. And so we're going to begin with our conversation today. Um, I would like us to, uh, we will have an opportunity for all of you who are uh, participating or attending to uh, post your questions in the Q&A uh, box um, at the bottom of the, of the screen. But we'll start with some questions and we'll begin with Rosenthal. So Rosenthal, I, I, I wanted you to share with us a few highlights about your career and work at UT Austin as the director of the Knight Center. Can you tell us a little bit about the inception of the center and the most salient aspects of the center and also how the work has grown over the years? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here in this uh, conversation. The Knight Center was created in 2002 as uh, an, an outreach program you know, my dream coming through, because, coming through because in reality was a way to help journalists in Latin America and the Caribbean with an uh, outreach, with um, kind of training, etc. So in the first stage of the, of the program, we helped create an, a new generation of, uh, of journalists organizations, uh, similar to the ones that we find here in the United States. Like, for example, the, our first project was in Brazil, helping journal, local journalists to, to create Abragi, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, investigative reporters and editors here in the US. Uh, and Patricia now is a, is a director there. Uh, we are also Argent, Argentina, Mexico, Peru, Chile, we, we help create this kind of networks of journalists. Uh, the, the other aspect that grew a lot throughout the years was the distance learning. We have been a pioneer of using uh, digital tech technology for journalism training. And in, uh, in the last few years, uh, since 2012, we started in 2003, but in 2012, we start uh, having MOOCs, massive open online courses for journalists and we are about to reach a quarter of a million of uh, students uh, that have been um, mainly journalists that have, have, have been receiving uh, journalism training, uh, especially adapting to the digital revolution, re, what's called reskilling, right? The reskill uh, um, kind of courses. We also have um, a blog that was a reference for the coverage of journalism issues that has just been relaunched uh, with the name of LATAM Journalism Review. And we have several other programs and one of them is the International Symposium on Online Journalism that we have been hosting since 1999. So it was one of the first gatherings of uh, journalists and, and scholars to discuss the future of, of journalism in the digital age. And we have uh, this year for the first time in 21 years, we could not host it in Austin, but we, we had it uh, a couple of, of weeks ago online and uh, it was a lot of work, but it was a big success. We had thousands of people from 134 countries participating in the conference. Thank you, Rosenthal. I'm wondering whether our colleagues and our friends um, have had any connection um, to, uh, to the center and if you would like to speak to that. Y 
you mentioned that Patricia was connected to the center well, and that no, I, we... I mentioned that Pat Patricia is a, a very active participant of the investigative journalism organization in Brazil. I think you are you are mute, Patricia. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't, the connection is not perfect here. Yes, well, I, I met, I was a transfer student at UT Austin in 1996. Uh, unfortunately, I did not graduate in Texas. I had to go back to Brazil, but I had the privilege of meeting uh, Rosenthal back then. And he's been a role model to all of us Brazilian journalists ever since then. So fortunately, I don't have the degree at UT Austin. Maybe I'll go back sometime. And it's a huge honor to be able to speak speak to alumni um, here, Sonia. Thank you. Well, we, we believe that once a Longhorn, always a Longhorn. So um, you're part of the family, obviously, and we're very proud of your, of your successes and those of your colleagues. And actually, I'm, I'm curious, um, I'd like to ask all of you a question and, and, and also, Patricia, if you could, if you could uh, lead with the response. Um, I, I made, uh, we, we polled some of our uh, alumni and obviously the one thing that's on everybody's mind and the fact that you are located in Brazil, we're in the US and the, um, the, um, the failure of our governments in handling the, the pandemic is something that's very much um, at the forefront of the news uh, cycle, uh, at least here in the US and also in Brazil as we've been looking. And so you have um, extensive experience uh, working, Patricia, um, um, and reporting on medical crises, having covered uh, the Ebola virus and the ways in which it was handled in Sierra Leone in, in 2014. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how information has been communicated by officials in Brazil with regards to COVID-19 and your take on how it's been reported uh, by journalists in Brazil. Um, yes, I, I did uh, cover the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, and I have been covering the COVID-19 uh, pandemic here in Brazil. I have been uh, reporting in public hospitals. We do have uh, universal access to health here in Brazil, but uh, we don't have many resources at the hospitals. And the fact that the government, the central government, the federal government, has a totally different message to the population, uh, it's actually making everybody confused because you have the president saying, you know, you don't need social distancing. This is all an exaggeration. He's actually used the term, it's just a flu, like a regular flu. Uh, while the governors and, and the mayors are trying to keep people, you know, to respect the rules and to keep social distancing. So uh, this, uh, the government has been sort of sabotaging the whole uh, messaging. And it is part of it that it's very difficult for us journalists to get actual data on infected people, um, uh, deaths by the disease. The government ever, uh, since the end of April, uh, in their social media accounts, they have only been uh, publishing something that they call the scoreboard of, of life they omit the numbers of deaths and only speak about people who have been cured. And then a month after that, they just suddenly changed the way they were accounting for the number of cases. They were no longer uh, publishing uh, the accumulated uh, cases, number of accumulated cases. So that led uh, the main media outlets in Brazil to join and to do like a consortium with the state governments to actually try to get uh, data that was uh, trust, that we can trust. So now we have two different account, uh, accountings. We have the government releasing some data that we no longer know if we can trust, and then the media outlets and the, the state governments. So that is a good um, example of how uh, chaotic things are here in terms of the response to COVID-19. I mean, ever since that you have the communication, uh, that is totally uh, ambiguous from the government and also the figures. So that's a huge challenge for us uh, Brazilian journalists trying to report on this. And we're, you know, over 94,000 case uh, deaths. It's, it's really a tragedy here as it is in the US. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm wondering whether Javier and, 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 um, and Fernando uh, also have a perspective they can share 
um, from their respective countries and how the pandemic has been dealt with and represented in the in the media uh, circles. Uh, I think in Mexico is pretty much the scenario that Patricia just described. Uh, you can take it and apply it in, in Mexico in terms of the data and the reliability of the numbers that are that are circulating. Um, there is uh, in at the national level uh, there is a, a, a big dissonance between the different messages that are uh, being sent at the highest levels of, of government. Uh, the latest one, I think, manifested itself uh, a little bit uh, like um, the one with uh, President Trump uh, earlier saying that, um, you know, he wants to reopen everything, you know, schools, businesses, and everything except the election. He wants to delay the election because it's very dangerous. In Mexico, it's kind of the same thing. The President López Obrador has been insisting that things are going very well, that the pandemic is being controlled, that it is being tamed, uh, he says. And, you know, yesterday the, the, uh, the National Secretary of Education said that things are going so well that students will not be able to go back to the classrooms uh, when the school year uh, starts in, uh, in three weeks. So, you know, this just doesn't make any sense how we can be doing so well, but uh, we can't uh, go back to school. So in these uh, contradictions, uh, it trickles down to the local levels. I, I've covered this mostly from the local perspective, and I've had to deal, uh, I had to deal with a lot of inconsistencies in the numbers. The federal government in, in the city of Torreon, for example, the federal government says there are X uh, confirmed cases. The state government says one, sometimes it says there are more, another day they, they say there are less. The same with, uh, with deaths, federal government has one number, local governments have different numbers. Uh, I live in a city where that spans two states, so I have to deal with information from the federal government and then one state on one side, the other on, on the other side. So it's a, it's a challenge. And I think that there is a lot of hunger for clear information that is just not coming our way. And some of the, 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 the biggest stories that I've had to cover have had to do with that lack of coordination. Um, for example, one story that I that I published a few months ago was uh, finding out that the the first victim of COVID-19 uh, was not the one that the federal government had said it was a patient in Mexico City, but was actually here in uh, in Torreon, in in my hometown. Uh, and you know, you can quarrel about whether one died four hours before, but that, that wasn't the point. The point is that information is flowing so haphazardly and so uh, slowly that uh, an adequate response to the pandemic hasn't been able to, to be developed. Uh, people were, at the, for example, at the, at the beginning, people were hungering for information because by, by March, uh, when the pandemic had been about a month in, uh, they still found it ridiculous that we only had 50 cases on the count here in, in my city. Um, so, for example, we tried to apply some of the models that had been developed in other parts of the world to try to estimate the real number of cases and apply them locally and say, well, you know, that's 50 because those are the ones that, that have been tested. But if we look at the different methods of calculation, we can say there are about 1,000 or 2,000 real cases. And so that gives people a different perspective on the scale of the pandemic, but it's really hard because the data is very fragmented. Thank you. Fernando, do you have, can you share your perspective? Well, uh, I have to say first that uh, um, as uh, it happens uh, in many events that are worldwide, uh, we have a tendency in Chile to um, try to compare and compare in a better fashion uh, to other countries. Uh, I remember uh, back in the dictatorship days uh, in the 80s uh, that uh, we, have, uh, we had a, a one point two or three months of the uh, GMP going up very steeply and the largest newspaper in the country uh, print uh, eight column headline that said, goodbye, Latin America. Uh, we were, you know, taking off. We were not part of the neighborhood anymore. 
we were the, the, new, the new Europeans uh, that, that for some reason were somehow uh, deposited in that continent with all the other countries that are not were as successful as we are aware. Well, that mentality to, to some extent sometimes catches up. So when um, COVID came from uh, the news in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, well, one of the first things that government said is that we, first of all, we were ready since January. Secondly, that we were prepared because we had uh, some um, best uh, public uh, health than Italy. And then therefore we don't have to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, uh, to esteem something really serious, that we were prepared in all kinds of things. Well, later, the, as, as the winter came, came over, over Chile and, and the people came back from their vacations in Europe, brought the, the COVID, and uh, let's say they do a flash forward, and we are now in terms of uh, uh, death according to population, we are within the uh, largest 10 in the world. And uh, we are now uh, experiencing a, a change in the Ministry of Health, which was uh, very fundamental, basically, to add new uh, data and figures and uh, inform the people uh, of, uh, in a better form of the reality of the pandemic. And uh, um, we are today with uh, a, a, probably happening in all other countries too, with an urge to open the economy, basically. So uh, we very rapidly, uh, if we see three days with not many uh, people being contagious or, or dead, uh, we automatically think that we are done yeah, and we are good and we can open the restaurants, like we can open uh, the malls and we can do anything. We, we tried that by the way, two months ago, and it turned up in a peak again. But uh, I understand that um, and probably in other countries too, the COVID has uh, taught us a lot about our own countries. You know, how we are, uh, you know, how are we distributed in, in our cities? Uh, we discovered that we have, for example, close to 40%, 35 or something, percent of informal economy without any link to the institutions at all. People living, the immigration, the immigration is one factor, but uh, Chileans uh, living, you know, six in a, in a room and, uh, and people uh, not having any formal uh, conditions of, uh, of, uh, of a good job and pensions of, or health, uh, well, uh, this uh, this uh, pandemic uh, somehow revealed the truth for I, I, and, and I, I believe that, that that happened in in, in all the countries uh, and in Chile it was very strong, so strong that the Minister of Health uh, himself, the former Minister of Health, um, said in a in a in a very vastly quoted um, phrase that he was not aware of the amount of people that, uh, that the, in some parts of the city of Santiago, the capital, uh, lived uh, one over another in uh, one single room. And, uh, and that was a shocking thing because uh, we're talking about uh, authorities that are supposed to know or at least have a, um, a good sense of uh, how the people are distributed in case uh, something like this happens. So we are now uh, with a new Ministry of Health who has uh, done something correct, which is uh, going to uh, the authorities in the territories, that, that's the mayors, uh, work with them, work with uh, some other um, uh, study centers, and we have a better picture of uh, of uh, the pandemic now, but uh, as I said before, and with this I, I, I stop, um, it is this urge to go back to business, go back to uh, economic activity, 
uh, as soon as possible. And uh, so we are very, we are very nervous uh, because we know that we have a new project called Step by Step that is is opening uh, gradually uh, different zones in the country, and uh, will 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 probably soon know uh, if uh, we can go out and do uh, activity as uh, we used to do before the pandemic. But we are very nervous about it. I tell you. Thank you. I think the three of you have um, really touched upon um, several words that um, have really caught my attention, and I'm sure they've caught the attention of um, of our uh, of our audience. Um, the first one being the idea of truth um, and the way in which information is reported. And uh, I've been really and, and as you said, Fernando. This has been a, a moment of reckoning for many of us, um, no matter which country we live in, where we're really reassessing uh, the ways in which we view our country and the ways in which our country and also our media uh, disseminates information. And so um, today, interestingly enough, um, and I don't mean to, uh, to, to, to I, uh, you pick on you on, on this one, but I couldn't help and thank you to Rosenthal, but uh, Patricia just published an op-ed in the New York Times today, um, specifically about the idea of misinformation and disinformation. And it's something that you've covered for a while and you've covered it in relation to the Bolsonaro's um, uh, 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 machine, let's call it the machine. And you speak to, uh, uh, you, you speak to, the, to the office of hate. And I quote here, you say, for the past two years, I've been covering disinformation in politics. I also became one of its targets in 2018 when I exposed in the, new, the, news, in the newspaper Folia di Sao Paulo that business leaders have, had been paying for the dissemination of millions of fake messages via WhatsApp to influence the presidential election that year. So if we transpose this and this idea of uh, disinformation and what you were talking about, uh, the consortium that you've created to uh, convey information that is true for readers versus the information that's being conveyed by the government, which is also an applicable uh, concept to many nations around the world, um, as, as um, Javier pointed out. Can you speak to us a little bit about how you've been able to continue to do the work that you're doing and find the channels that have been supporting you in seeking that truth and in allowing for that truth to, um, to reach the public. And that's, that's applicable to you, Patricia, but I think I, I would say it's also applicable to all of you uh, on the panel. You're mute. Can you hear me? No, no, no. Ah, okay, no, you can't. Okay, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, well, I think there's something that changed during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, because of all the tra tragedy and the sanitary disaster that we are witnessing in many countries, and especially in, in Brazil and uh, in the U.S., where the government has been really, really not effective in, in managing the, the disaster. Um, people are realizing the importance of, uh, you know, professional journalism and information that it's been checked and you have, you know, space to uh, both listening to all sides. So uh, I think there's a, a sort of people are reassessing the value of journalism that had been uh, really been suffering and, and have had been uh, receiving a lot of criticism, some of it uh, really fair. Uh, and now people are again, uh, you know, assessing that it is uh, important in such a situation, in, an emergency that we live now. And even um, because uh, this information about COVID-19 in Brazil, and I guess in the US as well, it's, it's just rampant, it's overwhelming. Uh, to have an idea, the main, uh, um, among the YouTube channels that are uh, transmitting information related to COVID-19, the most uh, widely watched 
are the ones that are just spreading misinformation and disinformation. Um, even Facebook recently, in the beginning of July, they banned several accounts in Brazil, some of them uh, linked to government officials and to President Bolsonaro's sons. One of them was directly linked to a special advisor to the president, and these accounts were basically spreading on top of attacks against uh, you know, opposition uh, or journalists, they were spreading um, this information about COVID-19, saying, for instance, that it was proven, it had been proven that hydroxychloroquine was effective and cured COVID-19, or saying that there was an exaggerated reaction to the disease. So this is someone directly linked to the president who's been using social media to spread such information. At the same time that this is a huge challenge, I mean, uh, we have this big, uh, I mean, no one has been able to answer, how do you make uh, true information or fact checking go viral the same way as this information goes viral, right? It's so much faster and it's so hard. But I, at the same time, I think the internet, the media companies and the public in general, they are realizing the importance of, you know, getting uh, information from trusted sources and, you know, checking your sources. Um, so I think, yes, uh, we are living a, a very difficult time uh, because we have hostile governments, we have this information that is overwhelming and it's really hard to combat because they have different tools. We don't, you know, we don't have outrageous statements to go viral. But at the same time, there's a realization in a society and among internet companies that when it comes to uh, issues that are, you know, life and death issues like COVID-19, uh, we need different reactions. We need to step up. And, and I think this is what's, what's changing, Sonia. Thank you. Um, did, did Fernando, did Fernando and Javier have comments about the, the the intersection of disinformation and the pandemic, but also the ways in which the government is representing that disinformation. And also, I think this gets me to another question, which for those of us who were either born in other countries or reading the news in other languages, one of the things that really uh, strikes us is that many countries, uh, in many countries, uh, the the, the outlets, the media outlets are owned by d different conglomerates. And so how are you navigating the fact that you are working for certain um, quote unquote conglomerates? Um, and how do you reconcile that with the information that you share or the, or, or the bent that you have? There was uh, just an article a few, uh, one of the reporters in the New York Times resigned a few days ago, a few a, a week ago or so, speaking about how there was a certain political pool that really made her feel like she didn't, that there was no space for divergent perspectives. Can you speak a little bit to that in relation to the other um, issues that we've touched upon today? And I'm, I'm opening this to, to any of you as a question. I'd say with uh, disinformation and misinformation, uh, we've had that share of a problem here in, in Mexico. Uh, in one case, uh, more uh, attributed to misinformation in, in, in that sometimes it was unintentional that people were passing off information and thought of it as, as true. Even some things that um, were eventually taken as true at, at the time that eventually became, uh, it, turned out, it turned out that the opposite was actually true, like if, uh, wear face masks. Uh, at the beginning, it wasn't that emphasized. Uh, and it was information giving out in, in good faith turned out to be, to be wrong. Um, the other one, I think there's uh, this information, of course, is the other part is that that is when that is intentional. When it, somebody is willingly trying to plant a false uh, um, story, in social media especially, uh, with the intent to generate panic or uh, draw the attention to a particular issue or whatever. And then maybe there is something in between when we see some political figures spew out, spit out these outrageous claims that are, you know, really stupid to, 
uh, any rational person, but for some reason they seem to believe it. Uh, like, I don't know, a politician in Mexico that said that COVID um, it was a, a disease that infected only rich people because the first cases from Mexico, uh, most of the first cases from Mexico came from a cluster that one got infected skiing in Colorado and then came uh, returned uh, in, um, into Mexico in February. Um, but, you know, you really don't believe that. It, it really stretches the mind to actually believe that. So it's hard to tell when, you know, what category we are dealing with uh, when we're not dealing with the extremes, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, I would agree with Patricia um, on, on two things that she said that I think are key in, in the pandemic. Uh, one is the uh, disinformation and misinformation and fake news are pushing people towards uh, seeking legitimate sources of, of information. That is bolstering uh, the role of uh, established news organizations, news organizations with a track record of, uh, you know, being accurate, uh, being serious, uh, being uh, deliberate in the way that they do their uh, their work. Um, I, I saw it at, at the very beginning, people were circulating all kinds of nonsense on, on WhatsApp, particularly. I've seen that diminish a lot. Or I've seen people at least uh, trying to put the brakes on a story and said, have you checked this out? Is this true? People berating users on, on WhatsApp groups, of, I'm talking about like friends groups, uh, you know, saying, please don't, uh, uh, don't publish, don't post this stuff until you actually verify it. This is not true, things like that. So I think people are actually getting more educated faster than what we were seeing in, in prior years. But still, and this is the other point that Patricia was making that is absolutely right, uh, we have not achieved the same level of speed with regards to the virality that, that fake news take. Um, uh, you know, well, uh, the stories that debunk fake news are not spreading as fast as, as we would like or with the same intensity, and that is a continuing challenge. Um, with regards to, to the media ownership uh, structures, I think that's a problem pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Mexico, it's um, uh, manifested or uh, expressed in, in the fact that uh, when we're talking about conglomerates, these are companies that own other businesses that are not related to media. So they're having an economic impact. So there might be a push uh, or an agenda to frame the, the story of COVID in such a way that uh, you know, uh, pushes for the, the reopening of the economy because the other businesses are suffering or that pushes a certain agenda that might benefit the other business because, you know, they've been hit hard as well as the media uh, companies that have been hit really hard. The deterioration of uh, their, the business model really accelerated with, with the pandemic. So we can see a lot of agendas that are being pushed by, by the, uh, uh, media companies because of businesses that they own in other areas. Thank you, Javier. That, that, uh, that takes me to uh, another question, which has to do with social media. Um, one could say that social media and the use of uh, technology like iPhones and so forth um, has enabled the rise of instant information through citizen journalism. And I'm wondering how has the journalism industry evolved and adapted? And how have you specifically incorporated this into your reporting? I'd also like to hear from Rosenthal as to what your perspective has been, especially with um, the latest uh, symposium uh, on international, uh, on journalism online, um, and how you all consider social media to have um, impacted the uh, citizen journalism and, and, and by default your work. Um, yeah, I, I think we are entering a media ecosystem that is, com is every day more radically different from the ecosystem of the industrial era. So it, it's a, com a complete uh, reshape of, of how we communi communicate, uh, what, uh, what the importance of the, the media outlets and the media conglomerate uh, is. Uh, is, is becoming different and journalists cannot ignore that. Journalists have to be, and the news have to be where people are. So if the people are in those plat, uh, platforms, we have to be there 
understand that and 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 uh, go from from there. But listening to my colleagues here, I have been very impressed by how the pandemic has impacted uh, you know not not only uh, the the media environment but the democratic environment in Lat in Latin America. In the in the colloquium Iberian American colloquium that we have the day after the symposium, the global symposium, uh, for 13 years we have had this uh, um, uh, in the Spanish language uh, smaller meeting, and one of the main uh, uh, discussions there was was how governments like El Salvador and Nicaragua in Central America have have been dealing with the pandemic and taking advantage of the, the pandemic to go after uh, freedom of the press. In, in El Salvador, for example, Bukele, the president says that uh, they, they don't need uh, journalism anymore because they have social media. So uh, in, in other countries like in Brazil or, or, in, or in, in Mexico, in Mexico we have, for example, the phenomenon of the Mañaneras the, the meeting that the president has every morning, every day, uh, rainy or shine, uh, the president has a, a sort of a YouTube meeting that, that is supposed to be a press, a press conference and Javier can explain this better than me. But, but you know, th those things that uh, what social media is producing is this sense of disintermediation that is com combined with a campaign to demoralize the press, to say that the press is the enemy of the people, etc., and that they can go directly to the to the uh, con constituents, to the people, without journalists, without the and anything that journalists do in order to to shed light, to to uh, work for trans transparency, etc., is considered. Uh, you know, a, a crime against against those governments. So those are my my comments. Anybody else want to add about the uh, impact of social media and um, citizen journalism, how that's in fact uh, impacting your work, affecting uh, your work? Yeah, I would like to say a couple of things. Uh, in 2011, uh, there was a very interesting book that came by uh, Scott Gant. The name is very revealing. It's called, We Are All Journalists Now. And uh, it was trying to uh, capture what was happening with the social media uh, and uh, uh, somehow how that factor impacted uh, into journalism. And actually, we have done uh, a lot of, uh, uh, has been a lot of change, and not everybody in the journalism uh, profession has uh, acknowledged uh, the, the, the gigantic change that has been. We are no longer the only ones who uh, communicate news. We are the media, our media, our traditional media is not the only media that there is uh, over there. And uh, we have been quite slow to understand uh, many of those things. I, I like to add something uh, regarding the fake news, for example. How does fake news operate? Uh, it is not uh, something false that I put in an empty head. And then uh, I, that head, that person, um, you know, believes it. It is not that way. Most of the fake news activates stereotypes, prejudices that that person already has. Uh, most of the fake news are reinforcements of uh, beliefs that the people already have. You don't like, for example, the left or the right and you put something of somebody who is from the left or from the right, and the other, the other side is going to believe it right away, or very easily. Because fake news uh, is very difficult for fake news to operate in a, in a, in a vacuum. It operates with the uh, emotions. 
and the and the feelings and the and the stereotype and prejudices that you already have. So uh, that's why uh, a lot of people um, need the fake news or need something like that for, because they reinforce what they believe. And so it's very difficult to confront that because actually we're going slowly if we if, if this continue to um, fanatis, fanaticism. Uh, which is uh, something that uh, actually you cannot deal with because there's no possibility of change. So uh, to, to, to close, uh, I think that uh, we are suffering a gigantic competition from who uh, at, uh, until, you know, a few years ago were uh, the people that we were serving they now uh, are there when things happen. They uh, lift their cellular phones. They collect the information. They edit it and they uh, deliver it in you know gigantic form around the world. And uh, by, by the time you receive the phone call of the accident, the accident is already in every single network. So uh, that's something that we have to. Uh, uh, a sect that uh, is not going to change back to the old-fashioned way of going interview uh, process, and then tomorrow, in the, in the next day's uh, newspaper, you're going to find what happened the day before. Uh, we have to be uh, more, uh, I think, uh, uh, more attentive to all these uh, situations, and uh, and especially in uh, in the way in uh, how we can uh, confront. Uh, the, the, the whole world of uh, fake news. Thank you. I think, I think your point is a very important one, which is, you know, the idea of wanting to go back to what was before is really not even an option. And no, no, it's, it's an option. the importance to embrace the new technology, the behavior of citizens and to counter that with facts, I think is what, um, what can save journalism. Um, so, so thank you for 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 your comments um, uh, about that. I I do want to um, ask you something that's a little bit unrelated and that really um, connects with what we believe as an institution. So we say that what starts here changes the world at UT Austin, and one of the things that we're really um, focused on is to. Uh, provide an education to our students that allows them to look at the world from different vantage points, to understand that it's important to have um, uh, distinct perspectives and to be respective, of, res um, res to respect these distinct perspectives. And um, in my, you know, personally, as someone who has uh, been an immigrant and who has traveled and worked in various parts of the world, I would say that um, to have the opportunity to uh, see how other countries, how other individuals in other countries live um, definitely has shaped the ways in which I um, react and I, and, and I view the world, even if I'm sitting in Austin or in, or in Nebraska or wherever I am. And so I'm really curious, many of you um, have been uh, correspondents in, um, in countries other than your own, um, and in, in much, in very difficult situations. And uh, I'm wondering if you could speak to the ways in which uh, these experiences of reporting from abroad um, have shaped the view, of, your view of your own country or the world in general. And I'm thinking, for example, of you, Patricia, Patricia you've spent significant amount of time um, uh, reporting on refugees and migration. So when you link that to that experience, to what we're seeing from the outside with the treatment of indigenous populations in Brazil, or um, if we uh, look at, you know, this longing for Europe uh, when you're thinking of Chile, or um, the, uh, the inequalities that one can find uh, in the US and the, you know, the structural racism as well as that one that can be found anywhere in the world. How, what, what are your greatest concerns and challenges when you report in these conflict zones, but how 
have these experiences changed um, the way that you report and change your view of your own country? And that's really a question that's applicable to all of you. And I'd love for us to, to hear a little bit about, about that perspective. That's a great question. Um, I think the biggest challenge for us when we go to a different country, sometimes a country that is more conservative or there's a conflict going on, we, or at least I, I always have to be careful not to see uh, the reality through my lens, which is uh, Western uh, white uh, woman, you know, and then try to uh, sort of adapt everything that I'm seeing through my filter, right? This is something that happens a lot. You have, you know, a foreigner, be it someone who goes to Brazil from the U.S., so they have this, you know, U.S.-centric perspective, this thinking, and it's the same with us. I mean, I'm going, you know, I'm in Brazil, so I go to, let's say, uh, Syria or Iraq, and I'm trying to see everything. So this is the main thing that I, I try to be careful because that's, that's the worst I think that can happen. You know, you're just uh, having a distorted view. You're trying to adapt a different uh, civilization, a different culture to your own culture. Um, and also the stereotypes. I remember two things. When I uh, covered um, the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, of course, uh, the public hospitals uh, were uh, in a very poor condition, had uh, very few resources, and we covered that. And then I think uh, one year, two years uh, later, I went to cover the Zika uh, outbreak in, in Brazil and the microcephaly cases among babies. And I went to the countryside of Pernambuco state, which is in the Northeast. And the hospital was not a bit better than the one in, in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very humbling experience or once when I was based in the US and I went to cover, I mean, everybody has done that story before about Detroit, you know, the decadence and how it was the decline of Detroit. And then I went to some of the neighborhoods and, and people, they didn't have, uh, uh, they were missing teeth. And I'm thinking, this is the US. This is the, one of the richest countries in the world. So people don't have enough money or health insurance to go to dentists and, and get. And this is something I would expect in Brazil. So I think it, it's always very humbling to uh, find out that, you know, all the stereotypes you have in mind or the lenses you come or the filter that you're using, we have to be really, really careful when we're, you know, talking about um, other culture, you know, and we're always only seeing a very specific and restricted angle of a reality that is different uh, from our reality. So we have really to be careful. And uh, connecting, uh, connecting with something that Fernando uh, talked about and what uh, Patricia is saying, I would say that the pandemic has all, uh, also in, uh, shown so many invisible aspects of your own country that journalists are becoming foreign correspondents on their, young co uh, th their own country because the reality of those invisibles that Fernando were talking about and, and what uh, uh, we are seeing in, in a country, in a continental country like, like Brazil or, or in Mexico, those are, are, are realities that we thought, you know, didn't, didn't, did not exist. And, and, uh, and the pandemic kind of ex exposed this. And this is not going away. Brazil, for example, now is, is uh, you know, debating what to do with those dozens of millions of people who, who showed up uh, in, in the economy, similarly to, uh, to the, the situation that Fernando described in, in, in uh, Chile. Thank you. So this, this conversation has been fascinating and we've received several questions um, that I'd like to share with you. I, I want to thank you all as panelists for your insights um, this evening. Um, and so let me just uh, pose a, a few questions and whoever is um, able to answer these questions, uh, please go ahead and feel free to do so. One question has to do with the presence of strong ideological pos uh, political positions throughout Latin America. Um, and uh, the fact that this is reducing strongly the ability to keep an independent position of media outlets. What is your take on that? 
Uh, I think that's a function of polarization and, uh, and that's not going away soon. Uh, I've seen in Mexico, I think uh, you're seeing it in the United States and certainly in, in Brazil. Uh, and that th the ability of news media to do straight down the line reporting is getting really, really complicated because that polarization is creating all these bubbles. And we've talked about this phenomenon for uh, at least a couple of decades, how the internet is frank fragmenting the audience and creating bubbles. But that is, uh, I think, in the current context of the pandemic, it's getting to be very dangerous because if you entrench yourself in a bubble in which you only hear not only the points of view that you agree with, but the information that seems right to you, then that gets, you know, then you're, you're putting other people at risk. I think the, the basic uh, example, uh, the most simple example is the face mask debate. Um, and this is not an issue whether, you know, whether you think or your opinion of the face mask is whether what the, what the data is telling you. And so you can filter out the opinions that you don't want to hear. That's not healthy and that's not good, but you know, that's, uh, that's your choice. Uh, but when you start filtering out the data and the facts, uh, I, you know, I, I always look back to that classic quote uh, from, uh, I think, uh, Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan that said, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. Uh, and we are increasingly feeling ourselves to be entitled to our own facts. And that, I think that is a function of increasing ideological polarization. And right now in a health crisis, it's really, really dangerous. Thank you. That question was from Jaime Morfin, and I just thought I should, I just, I should name um, who the question came from. Can I um, say something about, about that yes, question? Yes, absolutely. Because I think sure. it's a very good question. Uh, I, I remember in the old times, uh, Rosenthal is the only one who can relate to that. <laughs> uh, in, the, in the old times, uh, uh, when you had to cover uh, something in a, in a strange country, there was a, uh, I still have, have it uh, uh, somewhere in, in my room. Uh, there was this cabinet that said, when you're in a country and you actually don't know uh, very much what the situation is look like, well, interview two people from the one extreme, interview other two people from the other extreme, and interview at least four or five people in the middle, because two is somewhere in the middle of two extremes. That was the mantra at that time. And you have enormous amounts of reporting doing um, with that precept that you go to a country, interview uh, one band, interview the opposite band, and somehow you have to interview a lot of people in the middle because the, the truth is somehow in the middle. And the truth, we all know, is where the truth is, uh, not necessarily in the middle of something. So uh, I think that we have come to uh, mature a lot uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the way we conduct the business of uh, journalism. In the, in, the, in the field and back in the editing room. And uh, I think that today, for example, um, it's very difficult for somebody who tried to impose in a, in a serious and, and healthy news media, try to impose because it's, a, it's, a, it's the owner, or is the, 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 the managing editor, to impose a view upon the journalist so the, that they can uh, you know have, have to go and uh, but basically see uh, the situation just like uh, the boss. You th I have the impression that that used to happen maybe 30 years ago, but it's very difficult today, and it's very difficult again because we have a lot of editors judging whatever we do every day at at, at every hour and every minute, and so uh, I think that that's the is the good role of, uh, of uh, social networks, uh, which is they have the capacity to check you uh, because probably that, that those, uh, some person was there where you're referring to or knows about the subject. And so he instantaneously feedback to everybody about if you did right, if you did wrong. So it's not as easy probably as uh, 
during the partisan media back in the 70s uh, or the 60s in Latin America, uh, that, you know, a political party owned a paper and everything that, every news that came out of that uh, news uh, media was, uh, um, you know, in line with, uh, with the party line. Today, I think that that's uh, very difficult and, uh, and, uh, and it's very noticeable when somebody do it. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, so I will, I will pose it. It's from Bernardo Mendes Lugo. And he mentions, he says, um, how can enhancing and strengthening journalism in Latin America be uh, achieved, especially in countries where governments avoid recognition for the need of transparency and freedom of the press? Well, I think we have been working on this, right? I mean, that, first of all, uh, journalism has to has to be at work, has to understand that that uh, the media environment changes, the ways we we gather information and we distribute information are changing, but the values of journalism and the role that journalism plays in a in a democratic society, those values have not changed. And we should be uh, with with those 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 values and 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 work on that. There is a decline on the on the big. You're talking before about the media con conglomerate. There is a, de a, a an economic disaster in the business model of of journalism. But there are new new players coming up, uh, native from this uh, new environment, and some of them are are very good. Uh, kinds of, of, of journalism that are connected with those, those values and are, are, are pushing forward the, the role of, of journalism. I think in the, in the polarized uh, uh, societies that we, that we have now, those val values have never been so important. It's almost like uh, you know, following what Marty Barron, the editor of the, of the Washington Post, when Trump was in that uh, enemy of people line of, of uh, pro propaganda that people ask him about uh, you know, the position of, of an independent press. And, and he said, we are not at, at war, we are at work. So I think uh, what, what Patricia has been doing of, of uh, uh, you know, investigating, showing those kinds of, of things uh, are, are you know the the original values of of journalism will prevail? I'm I'm optimistic. Thank you. With these words of optimism, I'm so sorry to say that we are we have to conclude our program this evening. Um, this was a really engaging conversation. I want to thank um, all of our friends and panelists, Rosenthal, Patricia, Javier, and Fernando, for taking the time to be here and to share um, your experience um, and your stories with journalism. Um, if you have, uh, if you would like to say thank you or um, as well, feel free to do so um, to all of you, uh, Rosenthal and, and, and Patricia and everyone. No, thank you very much. This was great. It was a great conversation. I hope you can, we can do it again. I share thank you. Sonia's appreciation. Thank you again. Thank you. And to all of our yeah. alumni with us today, um, I hope that you took away as much um, from this session as, as I did. Uh, this was uh, the first of many Texas Global Dialogues. Uh, we look forward to our next event, which will be focused, which will take place um, in the time zone um, that uh, supports Asia. Uh, we are happy to welcome you to any and all alumni uh, events, uh, no matter where they are in the world, um, via this platform, and we will send you information about all of them. And if you're awake uh, at two in the morning while uh, we're having the Asia uh, uh, meeting, that's great, or at 8 a.m. while we're having the Asia Texas Global Dialogue, then that will be wonderful. For all of you who have registered, we will send you an email with a recording of the event um, and a brief survey, uh, because we would like to hear from you as to what you're interested in, um, the topics that you're interested in for the future. Um, uh, additionally, we ask that you don't forget to follow us on social media. 
uh, both the Texas X's as well as Texas Global, um, so that you can uh, have information for uh, all of our uh, programs. And last but not least, uh, I think that it's really important for us to recognize all of the individuals who have worked uh, very hard behind the scenes for this program and uh, following programs to come to fruition. So I'd like to thank everyone by name and um, I'll start with Lisa Anaya, Twin Nguyen, Nick Galuban, Fiona Mazurenko, Katie Schaefer, Celeste Mendoza, Darcy McGillicuddy, uh, in Texas X's, the summer, uh, summer Chandler, Dorothy Guerrero, Patricia Shampton, and Kim Gunderson. Obviously, a huge thank you to um, Chuck Harris. Uh, this is a, really a historic uh, opportunity for us to partner. And I thank you all uh, for attending this evening and um, hope to see you soon in the future virtually. But I can tell you right now that we will be in the city near you as soon as travel limitations um, have been lifted and, um, and COVID-19 um, is under control. I want to thank again um, all of our panelists uh, for taking the time uh, to be with us. Thank you, Fernando, um, Patricia, Javier, thank Rosenthal. Thank you so thank much. You. It was thank wonderful you. to thank have you. Everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.